I'm Matthew Bregman, and today we'll be talking about when to suspect and how to diagnose primary hyperoxaluria. I'm an adult nephrologist at the University of California in San Francisco. I'm the co-medical director of the UCSS Kidney Stone Prevention Clinic, and I also serve as a site director for the Oxalosis and Hyperoxaluria Foundation's Care Center Network at UCSF. This program is part of a provider education program on how to evaluate common renal symptoms and uncover cases of primary hyperoxaluria. It is provided by P2P Synchro and supported by an independent grant from Alnylam. Um, so today we'll be talking about primary hyperoxaluria, including the pathophysiology of the condition. And then we'll follow that up on how to diagnose the condition. Primary hyperoxaluria includes three monogenic disorders, and each condition has distinct liver enzymatic deficiencies. These impaired enzymes lead to excess hepatic oxalate production, hyperoxaluria, and sometimes oxalosis. Oxalosis is uh, the calcium oxalate deposition in tissues such as the bone, eye, and heart and when patients reach stages of advanced kidney disease. Oxalate has a strong propensity to complex with calcium. This is what leads to high rates of calcium oxalate kidney stones, nephrocalcinosis, and chronic kidney disease in patients with primary hyperoxaluria. So we'll be talking about each of the primary hyperoxaluria types independently, and we'll start with primary hyperoxaluria type 1. PH1 is an autosomal recessive disease that results from mutations in the AGXT gene, and this leads to deficient alanine glyoxylate aminotransferase activity. And on the next slide, we'll talk about the role of this enzyme uh, in the liver. Uh, and so you can see here in the proxisome of this hepatocyte, alanine glyoxylate aminotransferase metabolizes alanine into pyruvate. And when it's unable to do so efficiently, there's a buildup of something called glyoxylate in that proxisome. Glyoxylate is then uh, leaves the proxisome into the cytosol, where it is converted into oxalate via an enzyme called lactate dehydrogenase. And then this hepatic overproduction of oxalate um, is really the hallmark of primary hyperoxaluria. And this oxalate is eventually uh, filtered by the kidney, where uh, we know it can lead to adverse events such as kidney stones, uh, nephrocalcinosis, and kidney disease. Primary hyperoxaluria type 1 is the most severe and common phenotype of pH. The majority of primary hyperoxaluria type 1 patients will reach end-stage kidney disease by young adulthood. The preventative management has historically included robust fluid intake, crystallization inhibitors, these include potassium citrate or potassium phosphate, and also pyridoxine or vitamin B6, which can be helpful in some patients with pH 1. There uh, fortunately are new uh, treatments that have recently been approved by the FDA. The first was in 2020, a drug called Lumosteron, and then in 2023, the FDA approved a drug called Nidoceron. Uh, both of these are injectable medications that are effective for patients with primary hyperoxaluria type 1. They're effective at reducing urinary oxalate and also plasma oxalate levels. The management for those with advanced kidney disease, which we'll define here as an EGFR of less than 40 or 30 milliliters per minute, involves intensive dialysis, often uh, six days a week of hemodialysis. And this is used as a bridge to transplantation. Why would you start uh, hemodialysis at such um, uh, early stages of CKD uh, compared to some of your other patients that you might be initiating hemodialysis on? Well, for patients with primary hyperoxaluria, uh, you're starting dialysis early to avoid oxalosis, uh, that devastating condition where the calcium oxalate can deposit in other tissues in the body, again, uh, including the bone, heart, eyes, and other tissues. Primary hyperoxaluria type 2 uh, is also an autosomal recessive disease. Um, it, uh, but actually results from mutations in the GRHPR gene, and this leads to deficient glyoxalate and hydroxypyruvate reductase activity. And so we'll use the same figure we used for primary hyperoxaluria type 1 uh, to understand how this uh, disease results when GRHPR activity uh, is reduced. And so if you look here in the cytosol of this hepatocyte, um, you can see this enzyme here, uh, gl uh, glyoxalate reductase and hydroxypyruvate reductase which is responsible for metabolizing glyoxalate into glycolate. And glycolate is a, a benign compound. It does not crystallize um, to form stones in the kidney. Unfortunately, in patients with primary hyperoxaluria type 2, 
decreased activity of this enzyme results in a preferential conversion of glyoxalate into oxalate via lactate dehydrogenase. And as we talked about earlier, this hepatic overproduction of oxalate ultimately leads to renal adverse events. Primary hyperoxaluria type 2 is more rare than pH 1 and usually demonstrates less severe symptoms. However, about a third of patients with pH 2 will ultimately develop end-stage kidney disease. The preventative management for primary hyperoxaluria type 2 patients is very similar to pH 1, including robust fluid intake um, and crystallization inhibitors. However, uh, vitamin B6 has no role in the treatment for patients with primary hyperoxaluria type 2. We'll talk about the last type, uh, primary hyperoxaluria type 3. And this is also an autosomal recessive disease. Um, however, it results in mutations in the HOGA1 gene, um, which leads to a deficient 4-hydroxy-2-oxoglutarate aldolase activity. And let's look at what that enzyme um, does on the next slide. So here we'll actually be looking at the mitochondria of the hepatocyte. You can see here this enzyme, hydroxyoxoglutarate aldolase, will convert 4-hydroxy-2-oxoglutarate into pyruvate and glyoxalate. And so deficient activity of this enzyme, hydroxyoxoglutarate aldolase, results in an accumulation of 4-hydroxy-2-oxoglutarate in the mitochondria of the cell. Um, it is believed that this 4-hydroxy-2-oxoglutarate uh, uh, will eventually end up in the cytoplasm, uh, where via different enzymes is converted into glyoxalate, and then again, ultimately, oxalate via lactate dehydrogenase. So primary hyperoxaluria type 3 is also more rare than pH 1. Um, it's also the most uh, or the least severe phenotype of primary hyperoxaluria. It, prevents, it presents at earliest compared to other pH types, um, and that's usually uh, calcium oxalate stone disease, usually at early ages in the pediatric years. There are cases of end-stage kidney disease, however, uh, fairly rare compared to pH 1 and also pH 2. Um, preventative management for this condition is similar to those with primary hyperoxaluria type 2, uh, including robust fluid intake and crystallization inhibitors. So here's a summary of what we've talked about so far. So primary hyperoxaluria type 1, 2, and 3 all have deficient enzymes. The percent of diagnoses uh, is most common, again, in pH 1 compared to pH 2 and 3. And stage kidney disease is also the most common in pH 1 compared to pH 2 and pH 3. And then again, some patients, about 30% of patients with pH 1, will have some responsiveness to vitamin B6 supplementation to reduce their urine oxalate levels, but not all. And this uh, vitamin has no role in the treatment of uh, pH 2 and pH 3 patients. We're next going to focus on uh, how to diagnose primary hyperoxaluria. And so we'll be talking independently of clinical characteristics, lab testing, imaging you might choose, and then to really uh, uh, seal the diagnosis of this condition, uh, genetic testing is necessary. So what are some clinical characteristics that you might encounter for a patient that you suspect might have primary hyperoxaluria? So reoccurrent calcium oxalate kidney stones, um, and especially if you have the composition of that stone and it's uh, near 100% of calcium oxalate monohydrate, that can be a clue uh, that this patient might have primary hyperoxaluria. Patients who have a family history of kidney stones, patients who have nephrocalcinosis, uh, maybe a patient has unexplained kidney failure. The only uh, risk that you know of for, for impaired kidney function is uh, kidney stones, um, but they lack diabetes or hypertension, two much more common uh, causes of chronic kidney disease in the United States. Uh, perhaps they have oxalosis. Uh, perhaps they've received a kidney transplant and then they have rapid allograft failure from biopsy proven oxalate nephropathy. That could be a potential clue as well of primary hyperoxaluria. And so what labs might you consider for a patient that you're uh, considering pH as a potential diagnosis? 24-hour uh, urine oxalate levels, uh, plasma oxalate levels, and this is especially true if this patient already has advanced kidney disease, where the 24-hour urine oxalate level is actually less reliable. Uh, and an elevated plasma oxalate level will clue you into a potential pH. And then a serum creatinine, of course, to uh, estimate that, that patient's uh, degree of kidney function. Uh, I've included here on the right side um, a, uh, a photo of this uh, patient in my own clinic that I later diagnosed with primary hyperoxaluria type 1. 
Um, this patient, uh, as you can see, had a 24 hour urine collection that showed a urine oxalate level is markedly elevated at near 200 milligrams per day. Uh, normal reference range is 40 milligrams or less per day. Um, and this was coupled with this patient at multiple stone events uh, throughout their life and also had uh, uh, two siblings that had died of uh, kidney disease uh, that was related to kidney stones. And imaging you might consider for patients with uh, potentially with pH or, or reoccurrent stone disease includes kidney ultrasound or a non-contrast uh, CT abdominal study. And then this is actually uh, uh, the patient that I was mentioning earlier in my own clinic uh, wh who we got a CT for and had multiple stones in both kidneys, uh, about 10 in each, and some of them were quite large. And so I mentioned earlier, but genetic testing is really being the way to seal the diagnosis for primary hyperoxaluria. Um, genetic testing can be performed via a buccal swab or a blood sample. Um, you have options now um, for testing just the three uh, known genes for primary hyperoxaluria that we talked about earlier. You also have options for more extended gene panels, which include other uh, reoccurrent kidney stone disorders that we'll talk about later. Um, below here, you can see actually the genetic testing result from the patient uh, in my own clinic who I ultimately got genetic testing for, and the result came back notable for two pathogenic variants in the AGXT gene, um, which you might recall is the gene associated with primary hyperoxaluria type 1. So at this point, I was able to use this information to get this patient on appropriate treatment uh, to help them. Uh, it's important to note that um, a patient um, who perhaps you do testing on and you see elevated urinary oxalate levels, um, but uh, most of the time will not ultimately have primary hyperoxaluria, although you should consider it as a diagnosis, there are other causes of hyperoxaluria that exist. Um, this includes enteric hyperoxaluria, so perhaps a patient had a gastric bypass surgery, uh, maybe they have uh, inflammatory bowel disease that's not well controlled. Um, and these conditions result in an increase in the intestinal absorption of oxalate that's ultimately filtered by the kidney and can lead to high urinary oxalate levels and stones. Uh, maybe the patient eats uh, excess dietary oxalate. Uh, this could include uh, uh, foods like spinach, uh, rhubarb, nuts, chocolates, uh, and some exotic fruits that exist throughout the world that have really high oxalic acid content. And then last, uh, patients who consume uh, high amounts of vitamin C per day uh, can also develop high urinary oxalate levels. Um, this would include both oral and IV vitamin C. Uh, vitamin C in the body is actually converted to oxalate, and so uh, some patients uh, develop elevated urinary oxalate levels. It's important to screen for uh, all of these conditions when you're evaluating your patients in the clinic, including prior bowel surgery, um, assess their dietary intake of, of high oxalate foods, and then also assess for any uh, supplements or vitamins that they might be taking. Uh, similarly, there are uh, absolutely alternative causes of reoccurring stones and nephrocalcinosis outside the primary hyperoxaluria. So some common conditions that um, I see in my own clinic include primary hyperparathyroidism, medullary sponge kidney, and distal renal tubular acidosis. Um, I will say that, of course, uh, these patients would not be expected to have high urinary oxalate levels like you would see with primary hyperoxaluria. So that would be one way to differentiate um, these conditions from pH. And then there are alternative genetic stone disorders as well. And as I mentioned earlier, the genetic testing panels um, include um, uh, these genes. And so you can test for um, these conditions on some of the genetic testing panels. So some conditions include cystinuria, dent disease, Barter syndrome, autosomal dominant hypocalcemia, xanthinuria, hereditary forms of distal RTA, adenine phosphoribosyl transferase deficiency, and familial hypomagnesemia with hypercalciuria and nephrocalcinosis. Um, so I'd like to end um, today by talking a little bit more about the role of genetic testing. Um, as you can see in the case uh, that I presented earlier uh, in my own clinic, um, it was incredibly helpful uh, for me to come up with that diagnosis to get this patient on uh, life-altering therapies that have really changed uh, the clinical course for this patient. Uh, these, I found these genetic tests to become uh, or to be really easily easy to obtain. Um, the tests, again, can be just simply a, a cheek swab uh, or a blood draw if they happen to be in your clinic. 
Um, these tests can be mailed to the patient. A lot of my patients uh, in San Francisco do uh, telehealth visits, um, and thus they can maybe perhaps they live several hours away, and we can just simply mail the test uh, to them, and they can do the uh, cheek swab at home. I tend to get the results in about two to four weeks after um, uh, having it, or having the patient collect them. The um, the tests are actually sponsored. Some of these tests are sponsored. There's two commercially available uh, tests in the United States, and, and these are uh, sponsored by pharmaceutical companies to be free of charge for certain patients that meet criteria. I have found the criteria in my own clinic, um, again, reoccurrent stone formers uh, referred to nephrology, um, pretty much 100% of patients to meet criteria for the sponsored uh, free testing. Uh, so there's no charge to the patient. Um, I will uh, mention that uh, for some of the nephrologists that might be uh, joining us today, uh, they're probably familiar with Natera's uh, chronic kidney disease panel, which approaches about 400 uh, genes. Um, that will also test for uh, reoccurrent stone disorders. Uh, I've had some patients express um, concern. They're, they were coming to me just for reoccurrent stones and that the extended nature of that uh, panel uh, for them was less ideal than uh, some of these focused uh, 45 gene um, kidney uh, panels or, or even the three gene panel for primary hyperoxaluria. So I've had some patients uh, specifically request or prefer the uh, reoccurrent stone disorder panel. So again, just to summarize, uh, very easy to order, uh, very easy to obtain. The results come back very quickly. Um, there's potentially no charge to the patient um, and it can be incredibly helpful, especially when you're considering a condition like primary hyperoxaluria. Uh, the only barrier I can think of, I've, I've had uh, just maybe two or three times where the patient uh, declined testing uh, for a variety of reasons, but uh, I find those um, instances to be quite rare. Uh, thank you for your time. I hope you found this helpful.